Uh, welcome everyone, we're back. It's been a while um, since we've last had a webinar, but we've got a pretty good one for you tonight. I think you might agree, um, hopefully by the time we've finished. Um, for those first not familiar with Zoom, we're gonna have some, uh, some housekeeping notes. Uh, you're muted and your screen sharing is off, so we, we won't be able to see you. So uh, don't worry about being thrown on screen at any particular time. Um, our guest speakers are going to be just having a little chat with me. We've got some questions to ask them. Um, so we're going to first, the first uh, guest is um, short on time. So uh, he'll only be here for about 15 minutes. Uh, if you want to ask questions, we have a Q&A function. Uh, as you need to find your Q&A function, it's, um, you can't miss it. It's an icon saying Q&A on it. Please put your questions in there, not in the chat. The chat is for us for maybe sharing links or if you have um, some problem with your, your screen or something, don't go in there. Uh, just put your questions in the Q&A, and especially for our first speaker, if you really want a question asked, you have to get in early because he's not going to be here that long. And I can't guarantee we'll have the time to ask the questions anyway, but we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, the session recorded, including the Q&A, there is a, an option to ask your question anonymously if you're a bit worried about your name being, being put up there. Um, uh, you don't need to ask, wait to ask questions, ask them as soon as um, you feel like asking them. And there's an upvote function. So if you like someone's question, there's a little thumbs up mark. You can click on that, touch that or click on it and it'll upvote it. And obviously it will rise to the top. Um, lastly, don't ask questions in chat because I won't see them and they won't be answered. So um, I think a quick thing about the NNA, we are, as most of you know, uh, we are dependent on private donations only, so we could really do with your donations. We have a donate page on our website, which has many different options to donate, uh, or a simple way of doing it is to donate by text, and that's due text NNA and the donation amount to 70085. That's 70085. So without further ado, let's, um, let's start. Our first speaker, we are delighted to uh, welcome Mark Pawsey, MP. Um, who's the chairman of the APPG on vaping. Uh, and Mark was a successful businessman for 25 years until he sold up and went into public life. He was elected as MP for rugby in 2010, uh, and it's a position he still holds. Um, he is a member of a number of all party parliamentary groups, including on manufacturing, packaging, small business, cycling, and of course we all know him for founding the APPG on vaping. Uh, he's also a member of the APPG on Rugby Union, a sport of which he's a passionate supporter, as am I. So welcome, Mark. It's great to see you here. Good evening. Um, it's interesting in that list, you've got um, an APPG on packaging. And today we're probably going to be talking about wasteful packaging on vaping products. <laughs> um, I expect they might like those. those uh, Absolutely. And, and the um, small bottle size uh, that came in with the TPD is an advantage to the packaging industry. It means that people are buying more packaging than they need. Now, interestingly, most people in the packaging industry recognise that their products should be used at maximum efficiency and, uh, uh, you know, want to get the products into re recycling routes, etc. But, um, it, you know, it is a nonsense that uh, we've got these little bottles uh, that people yeah. are having to use. Absolutely. I'm sure we'll get onto that at some point. Um, we've got a screen. We're going to start talking about the vaping uh, regulations, or sort of vaping proposals that we wrote to the government and the number 10 policy unit about it at the end of October. And these were the proposals that we put forward towards what we could do towards a, a cohesive and a, a coherent policy uh, on t tobacco harm reduction. And these are the proposals we put towards vaping. Uh, replace bans on advertising of vaping products on TV, radio, internet, and in publications with controls on themes and placement. Raise the limit on nicotine concentration in vaping liquids to allow vaping products to com compete more effectively with cigarettes. Replace excessive and inappropriate warnings on vaping products with risk communications that encourage smokers to try switching allow and enable candid communication of rel relative risk to consumers, remove wasteful restrictions on vaping product tank and e-liquid e container size, and adopt a rational approach to pack inserts for both vaping products and cigarettes. Now, um, is there anything you like there? You know, can you comment on those proposals? What's good? Um, would you be supportive of those? 
Absolutely, and and uh, as you know, the uh, we we were, we kicked off as the APPG for e-cigarettes. But one of the things we wanted to do was distinguish ourselves from the word cigarette. And one of the problems I think um, legislators have is that there are far too many people who equate the use of e-cigarettes with smoking. And there are so many places where, uh, you know, uh, in terms of developing a vaping policy, they've looked at their smoking policy and just applied that to people who use e-cigarettes. Now, if we uh, accept that uh, vaping is 95% safer than smoking and it's not me or the NNA or any a, a, any users of vaping products who are saying that, it's Public Health England um, who've been saying that, then we really ought to allow um, people to communicate that message. So that, that's that's the first bit that I'm, I'm very supportive of and um, d- did ask a question on that issue in the chamber uh, a year or two ago. So um, you know, it, it does, vaping does a job. I mean, with one of the reasons why I'm involved in vaping is that I'm not a vapor myself, but uh, somebody in my office um, is an enthusiastic vapor because having tried patches and gums and lots of other ways uh, of, of stopping smoking, the only way that worked for Yousef in my office uh, was, was switching to vaping products. So I, I want to see that message to get across and I think in the last year or two there has been uh, more equating of of uh, vaping with tobacco uh, with combustible tobacco and, and we need to be able to allow people to talk about it and uh, the, the other two pieces that I, I do particularly support are the bit about bottle size and we just chatted about that there's, there's no rationale at all a, around the bottle size and the other is the bit about nicotine strength and one of the things I found out about vaping when just before we set up the APPG was when I went to visit a small uh, vaping retailer I saw how he spent lots of time with a new customer and found out about what their tastes were which brand of cigarettes they used how heavily they were smoking and he 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 created a product which was most likely to help the uh, the customer move away from tobacco uh, and now in some instances i recognize that people need a higher nicotine strength particularly in their early years of use of of, uh, of e-cigarettes um to actually make the switch and i do hear accounts of people who were heavy smokers who weren't able to get the level of nicotine that they need from their vaping device and have gone back to tobacco. Well, that's crazy. Uh, if we recognise vaping as a great way of uh, improving people's public health, uh, then we, we really ought to allow a higher strength of nicotine uh, for, for people who, who need that. So, yeah, so I'm very supportive of the, the six issues that you've come, for, come up with. That's great. That's that's very encouraging. <laughs> Thanks very much. Now, um, the second part, the second question I've got for you is, is as a parliamentarian, it'd be interesting, I mean, because the, the question we're asking here is, can UK consumers escape EU restrictions? Now, that might come as news to many vapors who think that on January the 1st, then the TPD doesn't apply anymore because we're out of the EU. But as someone who's involved in Parliament, what's your view on that? You know, what, is that realistic or, or do consumers have to do something to achieve that? Um, they certainly do, because um, we know that the TPD um, directive and all of EU legislation is being simply shifted over into EU legislation. So for the time being, the old TPD rules, and we've just picked out the three key bits of it that are that don't make any sense, uh, they've simply been carried over. Now, we do have the opportunity to change things. And, um, you know, I speak as somebody who supported remaining in the EU. I'm a West Midlands MP and I was bothered about the impact on manufacturing uh, of, of us leaving the EU, but I do EU, but I do recognise that you know, there is an element of taking back control. And one of the things that we can do is develop our own policy here. Now, given where we are with COVID and the challenge with the economy, um, I'm not sure that that's necessarily going to be the top priority for government right now, but it, the opportunity will come along. But government will only do those things if they get pressure from uh, other MPs and MPs react to pressure from their own constituents. So one of the key messages I'm hoping that people who are taking part in this webinar will do is engage with their MPs, communicate with them the importance of changing these three particular features of the TPD and how they'd like to see that change when government gets the opportunity to. And I'd also like people who are participating to encourage their MPs to come along and join our all party parliamentary group. We're doing a couple of inquiries on the uh, APPG. Um, we've got one coming up pretty immediately, which will be looking at the uh, COP9, the Council of the Parties uh, 
uh, World Health Organization um, uh, conference that's taking place next year. And we want to influence that. And there is some concern that the WHO is really is seeing the use of e-cigarettes in exactly the same way as tobacco. And we need to get a, a representation across there. So we're going to do a, an inquiry into that. And later next year, we'll be doing a separate inquiry into how we can fashion the UK legislation in respect of vaping and tobacco related products. So, uh, I, and I could do with more MPs, I could do with more support and more help in Westminster doing that. And that help and support will come from MPs who are in turn influenced by the enthusiastic vaping community who I know uh, are, are taking part in this webinar. Yeah, and I think it's also important to say, isn't it, that if we don't achieve that and we do have to abide by the TPD when we're out of the uh, EU, then we won't have any say in it. We won't have any UK common sense um, act activism there. It would just be what the EU decides. And some of them tend to be quite extreme. So we don't really want to be left in a position where we're at the mercy of the EU if they decide to make the regulations worse. Yeah, we, we, we want the opportunity to create our own regulation. I mean, it, I mean, actually, having said that, I campaign to remain in the European Union. And I'm sure that there are plenty of people who are vapors who cast their vote in favour of leave in order to, to take control, to generate our own legislation and do away with the, you know, the bits of, of the tobacco products directive that don't make any sense uh, at the margin. Frankly, it might have been the difference between us remaining in the EU and leaving. I don't know. But, but th there is now that opportunity there and for those who feel strongly about it uh, get in touch with your MP write to them in your in in your communication tell them about the all-party parliamentary group and ask them to come along and get involved okay yeah that's 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 great advice okay um we've talked about the proposals now that's fine we can have these proposals and we can we can ask our MPs to to look at them and 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 do all that sort, sort of thing but the crucial thing is how achievable do you think they are from your point of view as an MP? Um, we've talked, spoke about what consumers do, can do, but what, what could be achievable if consumers did their bit and managed to sway enough MPs? Well, what the, the three bits we want to change particularly are bottle size, nicotine strength, and the ability for people uh, producing uh, vaping uh, products to, to tell consumers about them. Um, I don't think any of those asks are unreasonable. I think, as I say, the challenge is to find uh, government sympathetic to those in quite, those requests at a time when there are all sorts of other priorities. Now, um, you know, public health is important, and you know, we're talking about public health all the time, particularly uh, in respect of the the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic that we're experiencing right now. And, and frankly, you know, I think if, if if we went to public health uh, on January the 2nd and said this is this is the, the biggest single priority for you right now we probably would get short shrift so we've got to pick our time but we've got to start talking to people and build up a campaign and one of the things that sometimes surprised me as an MP is that often I've seen some campaigns and I've thought well they're not going to go very far and actual fact they have they've achieved an objective uh, and you, you've just got to keep pushing and and just keep uh, keep the campaign going and the more people we can get behind us uh, the stronger that will be so um, I, do, I do hope that people will take my plea to uh, get in touch with their MPs and get, ask them to get involved in the APPG I hope they'll take those seriously. Yeah sure because uh, as, as you said the vaping community is very passionate and for us it means a lot but but in the grand scheme of things when you're talking about an entire removal from the EU a little subject like vaping might not get much attention unless they really put their, yeah. their you know, well, we, just, the we just need to make enough noise, Martin, and, and, mm. and you and I were present at the early meetings of the All Party Parliamentary Group when, you know, we could fill the biggest committee room in Parliament. So I, I, I know that there is a, a passionate uh, group of people there, and I, you know, so a group of people at one time felt that, uh, first of all, their enjoyment was going to be curtailed, and secondly, the method by which they'd managed to uh, stop smoking, having many many cases people having wanted to do that over a period of years that that enjoyment was going to be curtailed uh, and yeah. you know we, we we know it's much safer and i mean there is evidence right now that um people switching to vaping is uh, the, the, is starting to fall away as people equate vaping with smoking we've 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 allowed that uh, to get into uh, people's perception and we need to work hard to change that 
Absolutely. Um, I'm mindful that we're running short on time with you, Mark, and you, you have to go. Uh, but we've got one question which has been voted up to the top of the list, um, which is an interesting one uh, on the subject of inserts in cigarette packs, you know, maybe advertising vaping in cigarette packs, you know, as targeted advertising to, towards smokers to switch to vaping as you possibly get. What's your view on that? Um, I would have thought that would have made sense in many cases. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> the, the the industry has changed, hasn't it, since we set up the APPG six years ago, when it was uh, almost a cottage industry. And now, as they've seen tobacco sales fall away, big tobacco has got involved in the sector. And uh, uh, given that they are active in in both the tobacco products and almost all of them in uh, e-cigarettes and vaping products it would seem to me to be a sensible link you know I, I i i wouldn't i can't see any reason why you wouldn't encourage it uh, but it's currently not a, not available to uh, to to be it falls foul of the, the promotional regulations um it, it would seem to me to make sense yeah Okay. All right. That's great. So um, great message there. Thank you very much for, for sparing us some of your time, especially on a busy day like today well, with the announcement of the tier restrictions. It, it, it has been a busy day. And one of the issues, one of the good things, that whatever uh, tier people are in, somebody said to me that vape shops can now reopen. And somebody was talking to me about the biggest, uh, their biggest loss during the lockdown was the fact they weren't able to visit their vape shop. They were able to get hold of their product online. Uh, but uh, the, you know, non-essential retail will be open again and that will be good news uh, for the sector exactly exactly that's brilliant a great positive note to end on mark so right. um thank you very much for joining us and um and we hope to speak again soon and um and especially when you get the appg appg going again and i'm sure consumers will be keeping a good eye out on, on that so brilliant. thank you Thanks, very much for coming. Ha have, have a good webinar yeah thank you bye thank you. bye okay um we're gonna move on now by introducing our second guest, who shouldn't need much introduction for, to many of you. Um, it's Clive Bates, uh, former director of ASH, former uh, civil servant. Um, he's had a very diverse career, but now runs his own um, counterfactual consulting and is a good friend of vaping and tobacco harm reduction in general. So welcome, Clive. Hi, Martin. Great to be on. Great to chat. Uh, great to see you again. Um, so uh, we've spoken specifically about the vaping proposals that we had in our letter yeah. to number 10 and to the yeah. Department of Health. Um, but uh, we'll talk about those obviously further in, in, in the rest of the show. But uh, it's worth mentioning the other ones that we've also suggested on other products. So I'll, I'll list them now. It's to lift the ban on oral tobacco, and uh, which is snooze, and properly regulate all smokeless tobacco. Replace blanket bans on advertising of low-risk tobacco products with controls on themes and placement. Replace excessive and inappropriate warnings on non-combustible tobacco products, uh, things like heat not burn. Um, we've said about allowing and enabling candid communication of relative risk to consumers, and that would apply equally to other products apart from vaping. Uh, adopt a fresh approach to pack inserts, uh, which again, we've just discussed and recognise and regulate novel oral nicotine products. So, so that's all of the proposals in total. Um, we, we should start, I suppose, because we were talking about the EU. Um, what, we're trying here to ask the question, what can UK consumers do to a, a, escape these EU regulations? What threats do we have coming from the EU with the TPD review at the moment? Um, yeah, I, I mean the, the well the TP the TP re, TPD review is sort of you know lumbering towards a conclusion in in May next year. Um, the most visible sign of what we've seen so far is the pre preliminary report from the Sheer Scientific Committee, which is just you know a huge overflowing dump of garbage basically which has been roundly criticized by everybody who knows anything at all about the issue. Uh, to the point where I'm not quite sure how they're going to recover from it because the, the criticisms are absolutely uh, devastating. Uh, but we'll see, they, they, they're gonna have to do something with it. Uh, we also know uh, that the commission, um, you know, the civil service in Brussels is kind of captured by the uh, Brussels-based non-governmental public health organizations, various smoke-free alliances, ENSP and all these sort of people, and are very hostile. They, prob they probably feel that they were defeated 
in 2013, 2014 by Vapors, which they were, famous victory. You'll remember that well, Martin. Um, they didn't get their way. They wanted these things regulated like, me like medicines, and they got, they got bounced uh, into regulating them in this slightly ad hoc way that's now in the directive. So they've never been anybody's friend in this. They don't understand the concept of harm reduction, or even if they do, they don't want to be bothered with it. They think, um, you know, that every, these products should just be regulated as hard as possible. So I can't see them easing anything. I don't know, but I can't see them easing off on anything. But I can see them trying to stretch out to get bans on, on flavors, on uh, maybe more of an authorization regime, uh, maybe require more testing and things like that. It's very, very hard to know what else they could do really, um, uh, you know, that would, I mean, they could move much more in the direction that there is in the United States, which would be sort of un unutterably awful. Um, but I don't know that I would think flavors are probably the big risk. And, and then, you know, maybe more, more burdens to do with, you know, protecting against sales to youth and things like that. Um, for, for those in the UK who think it's, well, we're, we're free of all that. Um, well, by default, uh, we stick with the current uh, TPD, which is TPD2. Um, and we don't yet know, because we don't yet know how the deal, if there is one, will play out, whether uh, we will have the flexibility to depart from EU uh, legislation. Um, we may do, we probably will, in my opinion. But, it, but secondly, if we do have the flexibility, whether we'll wish to exercise that flexibility, especially because of the complexity that the, that will create between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Um, Northern Ireland will remain aligned with the EU uh, to prevent there being a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And therefore, anything that is aligned with the Republic of Ireland will be misaligned with Great Britain, and there'll have to be a border between um, Northern Ireland and Great Britain, if you see what I mean. I mean, it's a little bit complicated, but essentially a border has to go somewhere. And the more divergence there is, the stronger that border will have to be. So, so we've, got, we've got to just watch out here. People who think, yo, we're free, we're free of the EU. Uh, we can just leap off and do our own thing. Maybe, maybe, but also maybe not. Uh, and I certainly... Would, if I was a, a vaping, an activist, I, mean, I certainly wouldn't, um, you know, fold my tent and walk off into the sunset here. I, I, I think the TPD will be very relevant in the UK. And even if it isn't, we should have solidarity with uh, our, our comrades uh, in the EU27, uh, because that is a norm setting body. They set norms internationally. Uh, they set it for the 27 member states, but they will also be... Uh, active in the WHO, FCTC, and all of that. So what goes around comes around, and what they say still matters, even if we don't have a place in the room with them. Yeah, it will, it will feed into, we're pretty sure it's going to feed into COP9, isn't it? They'll feed off oh, each other. Definitely, yeah. definitely. You know, what, what's, what's the, what the EU says kind of goes in, um, uh, in the FCTC, the EU disagrees with it that it doesn't happen or the language is written in advisory terms. But if the EU has already agreed to it, they're quite happy to generalise EU policy to the rest of the world using devices like the WHO FCTC. So, yeah. yeah. OK, um, let's talk about one of the main opportunities. Um, in fact, this was our first recommendation in the letter to uh, number 10 was the ban on snus. I mean, snus is banned yeah. uh, throughout the EU, except Sweden. Um, but we have a chance, if we choose to take it, um, of, of lifting that ban on snus. And this is one of our recommendations, is to, to regulate smokeless instead of just ban snus outright. Yeah. Um, tell yeah. us why that would be a good, good policy for people who aren't aware. Yeah, OK. Um, so... It's an obviously ridiculous um, ban. There's no science behind it. In fact, it's the opposite. All the science says that you should lift, lift the ban and you should um, you know, allow snus to be sold. We know, we know 
that, um, that the smoking prevalence in Sweden, daily smoking prevalence is about 5% compared to 26% is, as the EU average, and about 14% in the, uh, in the UK. Um, Snus has done something fairly amazing that you don't see anywhere else in the world in Sweden. We also know, because it's been in the market for long enough, that um, that has led to lower levels of mortality due arising from smoking-related diseases, as you'd expect. So there's less cancer, heart disease, and respiratory illnesses. And it's particularly noticeable in men, uh, because men are the main snus users. So we have an absolutely iron rock solid case that this works as proof of concept for tobacco harm reduction in Sweden. Yet the, the sort of EU idiocracy says that this product, the one thing that we have absolutely gold plated evidence on, this product should be banned. I mean, it's absolutely ludicrous. It's been an embarrassment really for the last 20 years. Um, there's no way that these products should be banned. Uh, I, hopefully we can make that uh, case to the UK that it should be lifted. But you know, the trouble is moving backwards on anything to do with tobacco makes a lot of people squeamish. They think that we're, you know, this is all being done for the tobacco industry. And, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of letting the demon, the genie out of the bottle, the demon out of the sack, call it what you will. And the, so there will be resistance to it, even though the evidence is incredibly strong. Um, let's hope we can make the, the case again uh, that it is a ridiculous um, imposition. It's nothing to do with the single market. It's supposed to be a single market. It's supposed to be leveling competition across the EU. And yet you exclude the category that is known to have the best benefits overall. It's ridiculous. So yeah, definitely we should do that. I, I can agree with that. It's, um... I've noticed within consumers, you can get quite factional sometimes. You know, people who like vaping maybe don't feel like they, they're willing to support other products. But right. I've always said that tobacco harm reduction is our product. That you know, that is our yeah. argument in its entirety. Let, let me let me just lose it for a second on this factionalization thing. Okay, yeah, great. What you like should be legal. Okay, what someone else likes should also be legal. What somebody likes at one time of the day, but not at another time of the day, should be legal. Uh, even if it's one damn Swedish air traffic controller going nuts at Heathrow uh, because he's not got access to his snooze, he should have access to it. For goodness <laughs> sake, okay, leave the factionalism at home. This is about a, a four distinct categories, okay? Um, vaping products, heated tobacco products, smokeless tobacco products and oral nicotine products like pouches, gums, films, and all the rest of it. Okay, they're all distinguished by the same broad characteristic, which is that they don't involve combustion. And for somebody somewhere, they are a suitable alternative to smoking. Now, do not get in your factional camp and defend one against the other. The four categories stand together and they stand as a portfolio of alternatives against smoking, okay? They are not rivals. Um, neither should we have factionalism within the vaping category. I'm so tired of people going off on Juul because they, they like using some kind of mod that's the size of a trombone. Great, that's what you like. Somebody else, somebody else wants a Juul. Somebody else needs to get into the category easily without any fuss and then maybe they'll evolve to going to a vape shop, okay? The thing is, you've got to maximize all the opportunities for people to get out of the cigarette category, maybe after a period of dual use, period of ex experimentation, and then find their way in the vaping and the non-combustible category. And I don't, I don't think we should have anybody saying, well, I want to block that, um, you know, I want to block that route, or I want to block that route. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, Jewel or other companies don't do totally stupid things, they do. And I am saying that, you know, some of the things they've done in the United States, I think have been crazy, but we don't want to start replicating that kind of thing here in the UK, in Europe, when actually we should be maximizing the opportunities to quit, not limiting them to what the preferences of the vaping aficionados actually are. Yeah, yeah. And and it's worth noting that, there, that there's, um, you know, people used to be smokers, but there, there are very, very 
different types of people. You know, lots of people I've met just do not get on with vaping. But when you say to them, have you tried something like uh, heated tobacco? They say, what's that? Uh, I've, I've, a good friend of mine, um, I was up for the Conservative Party conference in Birmingham and I went out with this friend I, I'd known for ages and I said to her, have you tried um, heated tobacco? She goes, I've, I've never heard of it. And I had, I had one with me, which I brought specifically because I thought she'd say that. And she tried it. She says, where can I get this stuff? But they're not allowed to advertise. And that's one of our recommendations, isn't it, to advertise these products? Absolutely, Martin. So I, I also have an N equals one survey uh, to, to relate to you. A really good friend of mine, I bumped, I bumped into him at Waterloo Station. Uh, he's been a smoker all his life, you know, hard at it, you know, hard driving guy, works very hard and everything. Um, he, you know, he said, vaping didn't do it for me. Okay, fair, fair play to him. But then he whips out an ICOS and he goes, but this, now that works. <laughs> Okay, now I'm not promoting ICOS, I'm promoting diversity and, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom here. And I, I think one of the, the key things to understand in the logic behind the, the sort of NA, NNA position is that the crucial distinction is between combustion and non-combustion when it comes to risk. It is not between tobacco and non-tobacco or between vaping and smokeless tobacco or anything like that. It's combustion versus non-combustion. And the differences within the non-combustion categories are relatively trivial compared to the difference between all of those categories and the smoke tobacco products. And therefore we've argued that you should regulate accordingly. So you pick up a really good point. Um, we, we, you can advertise vaping products, albeit in a limited way, and we think you should expand that. Go, go back to the uh, Committee on Advertising Practice guidelines for all forms of advertising, which would make vaping advertising a bit like alcohol advertising. But, if, but the logic of that is you should take that through to the smokeless and heated tobacco products as well. Now, they're banned under the advertising of uh, smokeless tobacco and heated tobacco products is banned under completely different legislation, banned under the Tobacco Advertising Directive, but also the Tobacco Advertising and Sponsorship Act, which, uh, which is a, a primary legislation. So it's not implemented as regulations. It's actually a, a, a full scale primary, uh, primary act of law. And therefore, it's a much bigger deal to overcome it and overturn it. But it's still possible if you want to do it. If you want to put a coherent package forward, that's what you do. And that's one of the things that we, have, we, we argue for in the NNA letter and briefing. Yeah, I was going to mention uh, combustion versus non-combustion um, because that seems a sensible way of doing things rather than tobacco product yeah. or non-tobacco product. And we've got uh, in the in the Q&A, we've got um, uh, Jean has said, do you think the EU will take notice of New Zealand's policy to draw the line on regulation between combustion and non-combustion? And also the uh, New Zealand government says on the need to uh, need for different nicotine strengths. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure I'd really want, I, I, I've maybe lost touch a bit. I'm not sure I'd want um, uh, anyone to just import the New Zealand um, uh, regulatory regime into the UK. Um, but there are elements in New Zealand that I think are, are, are sensible, uh, you know, and, you know, we can make the argument for them independently of what they've done in New Zealand. Um, I mean, the argument on the nicotine cap thing is completely ridiculous. I mean, sorry, it, the cap is ridiculous. So when, when the EU designed that, they had actually basically a reasonably good intention. Remember the Tobacco Products Directive is not a health directive, it's an internal, direct, internal market directive. So it's designed to level the playing field for competition. Now, what they, what they basically said was, um, uh, you know, you should have equivalent nicotine delivery between cigarettes and vaping products. But then, but then the Parliament, the Commission, the Council did some kind of hokey calculation that was based on absolute nonsense. They were warned it was based on nonsense, but they went ahead and did it anyway, based on some sort of made up calculation that ended in 20 milligrams per, per milliliter. And I remember the, the debate at the time, you know, um, the Germans said 30, the French said 10, and everybody then settled on 20. I mean, it was like totally unscientific. So, it is complete nonsense. And you wouldn't regulate that 
using that quantity anyway. Um, it's not a relevant quantity. I mean, if you if you want to if you want to regulate equivalent nicotine delivery, you have to think in terms of the the rate at which nicotine enters the body and goes to the brain. You're not thinking about the strength of the liquid. You know, as I've tried to use, not a totally perfect example, but if you tried to you know regulate drunkenness by using the strength of the drink that you're drinking you'd be you'd be losing something here you know because basically people don't drink as much whiskey as they drink beer you know but you can eat, get just as pissed on beer as you can on whiskey um so it's a it's a it's a stupid quantity to actually um it's a stupid quantity to try to um uh, regulate it's a stupid quantity to try to uh, regulate and you know it's not the right way to do it if you wanted to do if you wanted to get some kind of equivalence then what you should do is look at the the rate at which nicotine enters the body and, and is transmitted via the blood supply to the brain and that would give you a better um, that would give you a better handle on it but to be honest the the, the, the nicotine limit should just completely go uh, it should uh, it should just be abolished. There's a, a limit of 75 milligrams per milliliter in the UK, at which point poisons legislation cuts in. That if there's going to be a limit, that's what it should be. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think that um, getting pissed on beer and pissed on whiskey is one of the better sound bites I've heard for a while in this, 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 this space. Well, we'll we'll, have, know, to, we'll not, have to save I'm that somewhere. Not advocating getting pissed on either, but I'm just saying <laughs> I'm just saying conceptually if you try to regulate drunkenness by the, the strength of the liquid in the glass or the size of the glass or all the various things that the EU does, you'd be wasting your time. You wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask you one more question then we'll move on and bring the next guest in. Um, I'll ask the same questions asked to Mark Pawsey and say these proposals that we've, we've put forward, um, what do you think the chances are of how achievable they could be? Um, right. Well, I mean, we set out a rationale for them based on based on um, four main uh, planks, four main foundations. Firstly, that the government needs some kind of win on on um, some kind of win on Brexit. It needs to show the Brexit isn't a total waste of time and an utter disaster, and finding something that it can do that's something you know something it can consider secondly it needs to it's announced that it wants to make this is a bold thing it's announced that it wants to make smoking products obsolete by 2030 now that is a very very ambitious goal uh, and even if it uses a definition of obsolete being five percent um smoking prevalence that is still very tough you still have to cut the amount of smokers by two-thirds to 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 get to that um, thirdly, the government has a levelling up agenda, which we've interpreted as doing better for people who are poor, uh, you know, whether they're in the, the, the blue wall states in the north or whatever. But interestingly, smoking overlaps quite strongly with the constituencies or NHS areas where you have the greatest deprivation and where you know the conservatives made some gains in the in the in the last election so i i i think one of the themes that we need to bring back into the debate on vaping is inequality and we've built some statistics into the argument there about how uh, smoking is strongly correlated with with deprivation uh with uh worklessness um with uh, um, uh education status and and all these various things and also made the argument that it's an unbelievable, certainly if you buy legally sourced uh, cigarettes, you know, like a, a pack of Mayfair, which are supposedly budget cigarettes, you know, like £10.30 for 20. You know, and if you were to buy a pack a day for a year, that's like 3,700 quid. It must an amazing amount of money to take out of the budget of someone who's actually not very well off. So we're trying to make the arguments for doing this around that. And then the fourth and final plank of this is, uh, you know, if anyone was paying attention yesterday, you'll have noticed that the fi public finances are in total disarray after COVID. You know, there's a my, my gigantic uh, debt and deficit has, has opened up. 
uh, as we try to deal with the economic meltdown. So some of the things that the traditional tobacco control community have been asking for, which is, you know, several hundred million pounds to, you know, beef up smoking cessation and everything, I just think basically are non-starters. I think if you're going to the government at the moment asking for big public spending in this area, you're not going to get a very good hearing. And of course, one of the beauties of the tobacco harm reduction thing is that it's a commercial transaction happening in a marketplace in which vapors, uh, smokers voluntarily change their pattern of behavior using their own money on their own initiative, um, you know, to, to do something about their health and well-being. Now, that in some ways is the perfect public health policy in a situation where there's no money and the populations involved are hard to reach. So we've yeah. made the argument based around those things and hopefully we'll get a good hearing. OK, OK, that's, that's great. Well, um, well, we'll move on now and bring in um, Louise next to you. Louise Ross, again, uh, with Vapors shouldn't need much introduction. Um, she worked in disabilities over 30 years. Uh, um, and then she moved into tobacco control and smoking cessation in 2004. She coined the phrase e-cig friendly stop smoking service, uh, retired in March 2018, but now works as a stop smoking uh, uh, specialist. And of course, is vice chair of the new Nicotine Alliance. So um, are you there, Louise? I, yeah. I am there. Hello, Martin. Hello, everybody else. Hello. Um, hello. Um, fantastic talk, Clive, as well. Brilliant. Oh, just, Thank just you. Just ranting away. <laughs> 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 love to hear um, you ranting okay we've spoken about policy and these proposals that we, we've made but i'm going to ask you now to sort of look into your crystal ball a bit because you're kind of in the trenches um with um you know tr talking to smokers about um other options and things like that um so uh, what do you think if if these proposals were accepted by government and they went into into force and we managed to escape the restrictions and stuff like that. Um, what do you think think would be the real life consequences of doing that in your experience? What, what benefit could they be to people that you meet? I think there's huge potential there. Um, and smokers often hope for some sort of magic answer. And we saw it in 2007 when Champix came along, people were queuing up to get hold of it because most smokers wish they'd never started. They kind of want to stop, um, but they want it to be as easy as possible. Uh, you know, they, they often don't want to or aren't able to, to put the, you know, the, the, the effort and you know, go through the pain of, of, of quitting. You know, it, that deters them. So making it easy for them with an alternative source of nicotine would be such a good um, you know, investment in, you know, in, in time, in, in kind of you know, thinking time as well. You know, let's do this. Let's find out how to do this. Um, and, you know, so we've got a big opportunity here to to change the legislation that applies to this country and make it much easier for people to switch. I mean, Ash um, estimated that uh, in 2019, possibly, you know, something around 70,000 extra smokers stopped because they, they, they vaped. And, you know, whatever product we're talking about, and, you know, Clive listed them before, you know, even if it's uh, a product with very small appeal, like um, you know, nicotine, non-tobacco nicotine pouches. You know, if if that creates a few thousand um, fewer smokers, people who switch to a different way of getting their nicotine, that's great. That's that's still a result for those families, um, for you know the the their employers. Uh, you know, who don't have to um, you know pay for extra sick time. Sorry, I'm ranting on myself now. But uh, you know, we've got a big opportunity here that we need to do something about. Yeah. And I think the problem a lot of the time is that, that, that smokers don't know of these products. You know, that mm -hmm. some adverts are banned. Other ones, like you said about the nicotine pouches, um, not many people know about them. So one of our proposals is to regulate advertising, not just ban advertising of, of all products, but to say that these products should be advertised. Um, you know, would that help to promote uh, tobacco harm reduction options and make them more visible and, and, and be useful? Most definitely. And I think, you know, we, we need to retain some very sensible and proportionate advertising controls. So not advertising them as a, um, a, a lifestyle thing for teenagers. Um, and, you know, I think I think we've we've got some very good ideas in this country about how um, it should be advertised as an alternative to smoking for 
existing smokers. And you know, if you if you're using imagery, um, use the imagery of you know middle-aged people who who want to who want to stop smoking. Um, and the, we, if we had much more of that, we would have fewer people that that you know I speak to on a daily basis really you know saying oh you know nicotine is really bad for you and you know vaping is cheating um you know it's not the right way of quitting as though there's some kind of virtue in doing it the hard way or doing it with nicotine replacement therapy but but that vaping is cheating and you know i as i say i have these conversations with uh, with people on the smoke free app that i work on um on a daily basis and it's it's just such a shame that people don't realize that this is a you know a very valid way of stopping smoking yeah interesting you say that I've, I've seen that comment about this cheating and it's just replacing one addiction for another it happens quite regularly um now when you were at leicester and and you you were sort of um pioneering uh, the use of uh, vaping with stop smoking services you probably got a lot of resistance and there's there's quite a lot of resistance still around do you think if for example removing the restrictions on some of these products and having them advertised and the government has sanctioned that would that make people in those services more confident of maybe uh, you know uh, being talking approvingly about e-cigarettes and, and recommending them it's certainly got to come from from public health leaders and at the moment i think we're very very fortunate that public health england is a, a world leader in in this field um, i think the relaxation of the changes of the uh, the, the TPD regulations and so on would actually assist that. It would make it easier um, to, uh, you know, to, to endorse you know, the advertising, the you know, um, high strengths, that sort of thing. Um, but we, we need the new public health body, whatever that might be after April, to, to sign up to this as well. Uh, I, I worry, and I think a lot of my colleagues worry too, that, that whatever replaces Public Health England, you know, if, if they're not on board with, um, with tobacco harm reduction, then we've, got, uh, we've really got our work cut out to, uh, um, you know, to make sure people are going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, we'll talk about what I suppose in, in, in your line of work is, is a prickly subject, um, involvement of industry. Um, you know, many of these products, uh, like Clive was saying, they're, they're non-combustible, but they're made by um, industry. Um, and we know there's quite a lot of opposition for that. But if, if, again, same kind of question, if the government was not recommending the products, but was removing restrictions and, and encouraging people to, to think about them as an option instead of smoking, do you think that would, again, make uh, people working it on the smoking cessation side be more sort of encouraged to advise on those, even if they couldn't endorse them, to at least advise on them and give information about those products? Um, because the government has seen them as an option in themselves. I think it's really important that, that stop smoking practitioners, uh, frontline healthcare professionals are well informed about what is what is around. You know, they, they should know uh, about the, the relative harms. They should be comparing um, or, or have the have the information to be able to compare um, a tobacco harm reduction product with combustible cigarettes. That's the important thing, uh, that they should understand that they're not the same thing. So, so yes, a, a, a broadening out of categories would be really good. It, it, there are still plenty of independent, um, you know, non-tobacco industry products out there for, for, you know, say a stop smoking service to use. They don't have to use a tobacco industry product. But not all smokers will use a stop smoking service anyway. They will make their decision, uh, you know, based on what they what they see advertised, what they uh, hear about from their friends, what they see in the shops, and, and they can make those choices. And if they choose a tobacco industry product and that helps them not smoke a combustible cigarette, that's fine by me. Yeah, I mean, we did a, we did a webinar a couple of months ago, didn't we, on, on different options. And, and uh, we had a presentation on, on snooze and nicotine pouches. Yes. And I, I, I know that we had some stop smoking people watching that and found that very useful because yeah. they've obviously had people come into their, their, their practices and, and, and ask about the products and they didn't really know much about them. 
So is there a view, you know, if the government did go for these, especially with, with nicotine pouches, if they said, yeah, we, we like those, we're going we're gonna to sort of encourage those, we're going to um, let people advertise, we're going to let the public see about these things. Um, would, would that, again, make them more confident in talking about those things? And, and would then the government need to offer some sort of rate education? You said Public Health England. There need to be some education about those products so that, so that if someone asked about them, they would be getting the right answers. It, it comes from um, a position of being open-minded. So some, some services, some frontline uh, healthcare workers will not open their minds to tobacco harm reduction. They, they will insist on, you know, nicotine being the, you know, the harm and, you know, they, 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 they simply will not be listening. But increasingly that, you know, education programme, if you like, will will increase the number of people who have got better information about tobacco harm reduction. And, you know, what, what I've always said is that when somebody does switch to um, a, a non-combustible product, they should tell their doctor, they should tell their nurse that they've done it, because the more times that is heard, um, you know, particularly from, from GPs, the more um, doctors will kind of get the idea that, that yeah, maybe maybe there is something to this and, and start to educate themselves. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, okay. Let's, let's, I'll ask a question of both of you and then we'll, we'll try and get through some questions if, uh, from the, the audience, if we can, uh, both uh, Louise and, um, and Clive, I spoke to, we spoke to Mark Pawsey and said, um, you know, cause this thing is all about how UK consumers can avoid uh, the EU regula regulations. But, he, he said, sort of get involved your, with your politicians. So Clive, would you agree with that? You know, what should consumers do about it? You're muted, I think. Sorry. <laughs> I can speak. Um, yeah. Okay. So what I, I find get involved with politicians. Okay. But basically you need a plan. Um, you, what you don't want to do is be contacting po politicians with a sort of general sort of wishy-washy ask and, um, uh, you, you know, bothering them, basically. Um, so my, my advice really is to, is to engage in two stages. The first thing is to, as a, as a sort of, you know, like a, a routine vapour, is to join one of the consumer organizations. So like the NNA in the UK. Now the beauty of that is that what they do will be to orientate you in a way that you can engage more effectively with politicians, i.e. do things at the right time, ask for the right things, um, make sure you're engaged in the right process, um, give you advice on what to write and when to write it. Um, so for example, in the, in the reply, Martin, that you got from um, the government in responding to that letter to, that NNA sent in, the government said that they're going to be consulting, uh, opening a cons consultation by the end of the year on how they may change the uh, you know, tobacco and uh, related products regulatory framework um, with a view to meeting the uh, 2030 target. Now, what you want to do is if you're a vapor, you don't want to just start firing off letters about that. I mean, you can, there's nothing to stop you. But if you want to really land some blows and you really want to make it count, doing it at the right time in the right way with the right politics behind you you're going to do that a lot better if you're a member of a consumer organization where they can use their expertise and their closeness to politicians like Mark uh, to kind of orientate you, not tell you what to say or what to even think, but to help you have the greatest possible leverage on the process. And to be honest, I think that's how the, that's how the game was won back, back in 2013. We had a loose alliance of people advising, you know, I mean, the, the vapors won it. There's no doubt about it. Thousands of people wrote in explaining their experience, very bold terms, and that moved the dial in the politics. Nothing else did, nothing else would, but that moved the dial. But what happened was that people were writing in at the right time, saying the right things, 
understanding the labyrinthine committee structure, the ordinary legislative process, all this appalling complexity. And that's where it worked, because the vapors were able to deliver their message at the right time, in the right way, using the right ideas. So that's my advice, repeating myself. Okay. So the, but if, in case anyone missed that, join the organization, join the NNA. And, and donate, and donate. And donate, um, and donate. donate uh, NNA and donation amount to 7085. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Um, Thank you. I, I don't know, Louise, maybe that question, I think maybe Clive has covered it, but I've got a question for you from Mark in the, um, in the Q&A. He says, do you think we need a medicinal vape product available to get more healthcare professional endorsement, or can this be achieved with just consumer products? It's, it's a debate that's run and run, isn't it? Now, I've, I've always been um, wary of the idea of, of having a medicinal product because I think it could lead to... Uh, an overuse of of the idea of a, a prescribed vape, uh, you know, for longer than, than it is actually needed and will actually add to the NHS bill, basically, when people are very willing to buy their own. But I do think now that there is a place for this, particularly in, in certain settings like, you know, mental health settings, for instance, where it could lead to, you know, um, healthcare workers realizing that you know there is potential here and maybe you know people have started off with that uh, with a prescribed product but then go on to buy their own and, and then you know customize their 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 buying choices to to what suits them best so yes I, I, I do think that there's a, a, a potential there I know that it's it's a very arduous process and it's likely to put off um, uh, you know manufacturers suppliers you know from doing it but uh you know let's see let's hope that you know something does come of that in in the next year or so i think it would be a good thing the other thing that i'd like to suggest is that if anybody is in involved with you know the big charities that are relevant to smoking related illness you know like british lung foundation british heart foundation um cancer research uk that you know that if they're involved with those charities and they they know that their health has improved because of switching to a, a harm reduced product but they make a noise about that as well because the charities have you know definitely got a voice uh when, when it comes to uh shaping policy yeah and and uh, just a little side note on that i, I did a, a thing a couple of years ago where i was speaking to uh, a guy who represent publicans and i asked him why we have so many vaping bands all over the place and he, he he surprised me by saying that they didn't really believe much of what comes out of politicians mouths but if a if a charity said it they would listen to it so you know mm -hmm. if charities came out and said to pubs look you should allow vaping in your pub yeah. um he said that would carry more weight than what comes from a politician i just thought that was a really curious thing at the time and, and i yes, still think yeah. it's, it's but, but you're right they do have a lot of lot of clout okay we've got a a question uh, I think this one for you Clive because one thing we haven't mentioned is that it's not just the TPD that could still be an influence on it but the the tobacco excise directive oh, yeah. as well okay and we've got we've got <clears throat> a question here saying you know what do you think of the it's from Richard again um yeah. I can't find it now but he was saying I've just answered it on in writing oh, you have answered that's <laughs> why I can't see it. let me let me say about that because it's quite important so I think uh, the the tobacco excise directive I mean if, if the UK left the EU, it would also be one of the three directives, relevant directives that disapplied. So you've got tobacco products, tobacco advertising, tobacco excise directive. The thing, the thing to understand about the tobacco excise directive is that the member states uh, retain, the re retain the right and responsibility for setting tax rates, including setting the tax rate at zero. So, so just because the tobacco excise directive is brought in to apply to e-cigarettes doesn't mean that a tax will be applied unless they set a minimum rate, okay? Uh, and uh, I think they're unlikely to do that in the first instance because there are some countries like Britain that don't want to tax these, these products. But the, what, the, what, it, what it's really for is doing things like harmonizing definitions. So, you know, what, what exactly is the thing that is taxed? Is it um, a milliliter of liquid? Is it a gram of uh, nicotine? Is it um, the price of the product, you know, an ad valorem tax and all of that? So it's really to do with tax design and how you, how you would actually 
set up a tax regime if a company, uh, sorry, if a country wanted to, to do it. And, and that, that regime would be common across the countries that wanted to do it. So I, I don't, you know, and, the, and at the moment, what you have is lots of countries doing it in an ad hoc way, changing the definitions all the time. Um, so in some ways, bringing it into that directive might be beneficial. Obviously, it wouldn't be beneficial if they set a minimum rate. But at, at the moment, I, unless somebody's got more up to date information than me, I don't think there's, they're going to set a minimum rate. And therefore, uh, any member state could set the rate at zero. And there would be, you know, it would be part of the framework, but it wouldn't actually be taxed. So I, I'm not too worried about that. And, and all the member states guard their right to set, set taxes very jealously. They don't really like, you know, European super state setting taxes on their behalf if they can avoid it. Okay, okay. Um, it's been fascinating. I've been carried away a little bit because um, we've got about a minute left, so I better wrap up. But thank you both for, for coming along and uh, it's been a really interesting chat. So thank you, um, Clive, and thank you, Louise. Um, so thanks to everyone else who, who came along as well. Thanks for the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through them all. Um, if you enjoy this, we, we obviously plan to do more webinars, but we need your support. As we've said, follow us on our Facebook page or on Twitter at, at NN Alliance. Uh, sign up as a supporter at, at nnalliance.org to be added to the mailing list. Find and subscribe to our YouTube channel where we'll be publishing this webinar um, and any future ones. Um, and most of all, we rely on private donations. So please see the donate page on the website, which has many options to help. And the simplest of which is simply text NNA plus the donation amount to 7085. And you can do that whenever you like. You, you can do that when you're in the pub once they're open again, if you're in a tier that is allowing the pubs to open again, or you can do it in the bath or wherever you choose. But just text NNA plus the donation amount to 7085. So I hope you have a pleasant uh, whatever time of day it is where you are. Uh, but from the UK, have a good evening and hope to see you next time.